Good morning, everybody. It's Pastor Beth. Um, just happy to be here today. Decided that Eric needed a little bit of a break with moving and some of the other things that he's involved in. So um, I volunteered to come preach this week to be a little supportive of the person that I now mentor. Some of you don't know um, that currently I'm at St. Andrews United Methodist Church. I've been filling in for two weeks and will fill in through the end of June um, with a situation that arose there. So um, it's kind of nice to be able to do both at this point and to be supportive of both churches. So looking forward to that. As we come to our worship today, let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that your grace follow us wherever we go. We pray for steady hearts and loving hearts and open arms and hands as we view the things that have happened in our nation in the past couple of weeks. We pray, Lord, for calmness and for a sense of peace that only comes when we walk with you and acknowledge that our neighbors are the same heart as who we are. And so, Lord, as we speak about making disciples of all nations in the Sunday after Pentecost, we just pray your blessing be upon us. We pray for those pastors who find themselves in transition in the coming weeks. We pray for our district superintendent, Larry, whose last Sunday is today as he moves out on Tuesday and begins his new ministry in the church that he's already served in Faith, Montoursville. We pray for Gary Weaver, who will be moving in toward the end of the week and take up his mantle of the district superintendency beginning July 1st, and for his wife Cindy and all that he brings to us. And we pray for both of these people as they fulfill their call to ministry. We pray, Lord, for our churches as we move from part-time back to full-time. And we pray, Lord, that the time will come when we're able to worship physically together in the sanctuary to hear your words and to support one another, not from a distance, but from close at hand. And so, Father God, our prayers lift to you in this time, this first Sunday in June, the first Sunday of ordinary time. And we ask that your blessing be with us. All these things we pray in thy name. Amen. The season after Pentecost is called Ordinary Time that I just referenced in our prayer. So if you see behind me, the pyramids are green because this is a season that goes until Advent, and it's a time of growing where we hear of Jesus' work uh, among the disciples and how he brings people to the kingdom of God through both his example and the example of his disciples. So Today, we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, and the 16th through 20th verses. It's a very short scripture lesson, but it has great power. So let us hear those words. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here we are. It's the Sunday after Pentecost. Pentecost, as we know, is the birthday of the church. And Last week, as I worshipped, uh, listening to Eric's sermon and heard the, saw the beautiful arrangement behind him, it was a, an arrangement of power, of fire. And so that fire came to the disciples, and they were sent out two by two so that one would not have to face people by themselves, but they would have companions in the journey. So in this second Sunday, the disciples have all gathered on the mountain, and we know that when the mountain is referenced in the Bible, it's a time of great holiness, that something wonderful is going to happen. And sure enough, Jesus has come just as he has promised them one last time. And he brings to them the power of what has already been given to him, but he takes it a little bit further and he says, okay, 
you have the power of the Holy Spirit, but this is going to be how you use that power. And he said, I want you to go out into all the world, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I want you to go out and make disciples of all people, not just the ones that live in your neighborhood, not just the ones that live down the street, not just the ones that you hang out with at whatever social club you're involved in, not that the ones you hang out, just the ones you hang out at work, not just the ones you see at the grocery store or the restaurant or wherever, wherever it is that you go, but to make an example so that all people, regardless of where they are from, no matter the color of their skin, all people know the good news, which is Jesus Christ, right? And so if we come to faith, we got to be the example. I got to tell you a story that happened a long time ago. Um, I Believe me, I fact-checked this with my mother. My mother is 84 years old. She lives in Michigan, okay? And I'm going to be 64, so I figured between the two of us, elderly brains might figure out whether or not this um, thing actually happened, and it did. When I was about five years old, um, my parents didn't have a whole lot of money, so we went on a vacation. Dad was finishing up seminary to be an ordained pastor, and Mom was fr finishing up nursing school to be a licensed nurse. And like I said, there were three kids, and we didn't have a whole lot of money, and my mother somehow had gotten to be friends with a guy by the name of Clarence Jordan, down in Georgia. And Clarence uh, was the author of the Cotton Patch Gospels, which I'm really sure not a whole lot of people know about, but he had written the Gospels in language that people would understand. It kind of was a precursor of some of the modern Bibles that we have, uh, the New Life Bible and some of the other ones, the Word. And the other thing that distinguished Clarence and his family is that they were on the forefront in Georgia of being inclusive when it came to race. They had uh, a commune kind of thing where people could come and find a job and it didn't matter the color of the skin, all were welcome. And my mother somehow had gotten in touch with him and that's where we were going on vacation. It was a vacation with a purpose. Well, to get to, um, Koinonia Farms, which is where we were going, we had to go through Atlanta. And we worked it so that we were going through Atlanta on a Sunday morning. And my parents, who had heard some of the sermons of uh, Martin Luther King, decided that that's where they wanted to go to church, to hear Dr. King. And so we found ourselves on a Sunday morning in Atlanta in the church where Dr. King was preaching. And honestly, I was five, my brother was three, and my youngest brother was one, so I don't remember a whole lot about that. But mom and dad said that the people in the church made them feel very welcome, took them up to the balcony where they could really hear Dr. King's sermon and feel the sense of that congregation. And of course, some very nice lady came up and invited mom and dad to let my brothers and I go to where? The nursery, which was where every five, three, and one-year-old belonged. So she took us to the nursery, and we played with Dr. King's kids and a lot of the other kids, and after church, the nice lady brought us back and reunited us with our parents, and she said something kind of odd to my parents. She said, uh, do you have a black maid? And my parents were like, no, we don't have a black maid. We're broke. And she said, well, the reason I asked that is because your kids played nice with all the other kids, and it didn't seem like that big of a deal. And my parents said, well, that's kind of what we taught them. And, you know, little kids don't always see that people are different. They just want to play. Dr. King and his wife invited us out for dinner, but uh, mom and dad, like I said, didn't have a whole lot of money and felt like they should take them out, so they declined, and I was like, you did what? You had an opportunity to have lunch, 
And they were like, well, we were broke. We didn't want to be embarrassed, and we didn't want to embarrass them. It's like, okay, that makes sense. Now, take it 50 years later, and I'm in Atlanta again. I'm about 53, 54, and I'm at a seminar at the United Methodist Retreat Center in Atlanta, taking a class with the Alban Institute. And it was a class on um, church growth. Yeah, my favorite thing. <laughs> And I don't know what was going on, if my hair was short or if I had a cold, but I was in line for the dining hall before class started at 7. And these guys came up to me, and, you know, I don't know if I was gawking, trying to make up my mind, and they said, excuse us, sir. And I said, you're excused, but I'm a female, and I were just, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And so to make up for their little um, mistake, <coughs> excuse me, they invited me to sit with them. So, you know, we got our dinner and, and sat together and talked, and they told me that they were from someplace out in Tennessee and, you know, their church and all the ministries they had and about their families and all that stuff. And when these guys came up for air, they said, and so where are you from? And I said, Pennsylvania. And they looked at me with deadpan face, and they said, we don't sit with Yankees. And I thought they were kidding I thought it was a joke, but they were dead serious. They got up and, you know, not making a big deal out of it, but they left. Well, you have been with me long enough since um, August to know that I have a wicked sense of humor. And so in class the next morning, there was a seat right next to these guys, and I took it, and I said to them, hey, have you sat with a Yankee lately? And they were not amused. But, you know, this is like a Christian seminar, and they had to behave. So every morning for the next two, three mornings, the class was four days, I would sit with them and say, have you sat with a Yankee yet? And I'm like, oh, please, God, don't let them do something here. And they were not happy, but what could they do? There are other Christians looking at how they are acting. So when I got home, I thought, okay, I'm going to take this just a little bit further. And I went to New York with a friend for something. And in New York are what? New York Yankee stores. So I got Yankee hats. I got Yankee mints. I got Yankee pens. And I got a big Yankee flag and sent it all to Tennessee. Now, let me clue you in on something. If you want me to go totally nuts, do not respond. And they didn't. And I went, I was thinking, well, they'll at least send me something back, some acknowledgement, even if it's not nice. Not a word. And I thought to myself later, well, you know what? Some people just are not finished fighting the battle that has long ago ceased. They're still fighting the war of northern aggression, and that battle has been in our history books for quite some time. You know, brothers and sisters, we all have times when we're uncomfortable, and it's not just with people of other colors, but maybe it's with a child who looks a little different than everyone else. When we were visiting at Give Kids the World and working, there was a child who was very low functioning. And I don't know what his illness was because, quite frankly, we're not allowed to ask. And there's good reason for that. And we were talking to the parents of this child, and they said, oh, so-and-so just is having a wonderful time, and, and he's having a great time now. And I thought to myself, prejudiced as I was, how can you tell that this child's having a good time? And I, I must have looked a little funny because the mom looked at me and she said, you can tell by his spirit that he's happy. And I took another look, and sure enough, you could see his spirit brighten up because it was clear that he wasn't just some kind of anomaly, some kind of a freak, but he was a child who was loved dearly by those who are around him. Sometimes we look at somebody who's different than ours, somebody who may be handicapped, 
or somebody who speaks a little bit differently. And we don't fully understand that. And that's when we have to bring ourselves up short a little bit. And just remember that each and every one of us is a child of God. And so the disciples are on that mountain. And Jesus comes and he says, this is the last thing that I have to tell you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, preach peace, preach understanding, preach faith, and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And do not withhold faith from someone because they may be different from you. But with the same heartbeat that beats within each of us, bring them to Jesus, just as one time you were brought to Jesus. Through what? Through love. So I'm not sure what's coming next in our nation, but I do know that I pray for the soul of who we are and that our differences become melded into one heart and one faith and one nation, and one love of Jesus. Thanks, everybody. Let's have a benediction, and then we'll close. May God, the Father who loves us so much, open our heart to the leading of his holy word as we go out to make disciples of all nations. Help us to put aside our fears for whatever the world may bring us, and to find in prayer and peace the opening way to faith. All these things we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.